Uh, my name is John Boyer. Katie Pritchard is here in this room somewhere, right? Is your window popping up yeah, or you just want to, you just want to jump up, jump high, jump high. <laughs> I'm tall. This camera's set for me. So she has to jump up to get into the frame. Uh, and we are going to do a presentation. I say we, I'll do most of the talking and then Katie will do all of the answering because she actually is the force behind all of this technologically speaking and a lot of the things that we've crafted over the course of the last couple of decades. Uh, she's been a major motivator behind it. Having said that, uh, welcome everyone. It's a beautiful spring day here in Blacksburg, Virginia, where I'm uh, telecasting from, as we used to say back in the day. It's such a beautiful day, in fact, that I'm shocked that anyone would be attending this online session. So I'm exceptionally happy to uh, have all these wonderful faces here in front of me and hope this is an interesting talk for you. And uh, I have zero aspirations of actually getting through the 500 slides I have. So when you have a question, Katie is manning the phones. Uh, and if you have a question, either text or if there's a way to signal, just go ahead and ask. And we'll, I'll stop talking for two seconds and we'll answer the question. Otherwise, we can try to wait to the end to uh, get to all the questions. Yeah, I think I touched something. Whoops, I was trying to get up here. So you try to make fix that again. Yeah, this happens a lot to us. Must have touched something here. There, there it go. goes. Yeah. Uh, so let me get the mouse up here and don't touch anything else. Got it. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we're going to talk about today uh, is the kind of encapsulation of, I'd say, at least a decade, decade to a decade and a half of experimentation with how to teach, how to structure a class, how to structure a syllabus to get the maximum amount of engagement and a bit of the cool factor so that students want to participate, want to be a part of it. And in summary, when I was asked to do, well, what's the title of what you want to talk about? It's like, well, we try to think positively about everything in all the college courses that we teach. So it's all about point accumulation, a positive point accumulation, which is positively engaging, although we've done no scientific studies to prove this, just a decade or two of surveys where we've asked students if they like the system or not, and by and large they do, uh, by a vast, vast majority. Uh, I'm John Boyer, Katie Pritchard, both at Virginia Tech, home of the Fighting Hokies, and let's get on with it. So the intro to this is, uh, when I've done this live before, uh, I, I start with Okay, people want to uh, know what we do or uh, how to do this, or here's the job description that I came into over 20 years ago teaching, which was, okay, we need you, here's the job description, we need you to teach a kind of core curriculum course uh, that's an introductory level course, so no prior knowledge needed. Uh, in my case, it's about the world uh, or the world of wine, as the course may be. Uh, it's mostly freshman oriented, but it's open up to all academic levels. Uh, a diversity of students uh, from different backgrounds, different majors with different motivations, with different knowledge sets, different skill sets, different work ethics. Uh, I will get, or we will give you uh, 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 some teaching assistance, maybe a one or two uh, TAs. Oh yeah, and, and there's just one last kicker for this job description you're applying for. Uh, you'll have to teach it to about a thousand to 5,000 students a year. Uh, and perhaps some or perhaps all of it will be entirely online. Of course, the last year or so of COVID has made 100% of things online. So how many people want to sign up for that job right this second? I can also tell you that when I uh, took this job two decades ago, the pay was about minimum wage. <laughs> so who's uh, chomping at the bit to get on board to teach a class like that? Well, again, I started doing this without any prior knowledge, no prior training, as is the case for uh, many college professors, college instructors. Uh, this is one of the few jobs that doesn't necessarily require any training to do the job. As you well know, most people at universities are researchers uh, or, or doing research for somebody else, uh, or they're doing this, or they're doing that, and then they teach class on the side. So, how did I get? to the point of how did we get to the point of teaching uh, somewhere between two to 4,000 students a year, uh, up to a five to 6,000 a year at our height of popularity years ago. So the path was 
pretty traditional. And I'm going to run through this exceptionally quickly because I'm not trying to make this uh, about me. But I started like most of you started uh, phase one, I call it classic old school. Uh, I took over an existing course. It's called World Regional Geography. Uh, it is taught in pretty much every university across the country, especially if they have a uh, geography department. It's a basic survey to the entire planet one semester, which uh, you should be tipped off already, is an impossible task to teach American students about the whole world in three and a half months. But it started, as, as these classes do, a young guy uh, or young lady uh, takes over an existing course and tries to figure out how to make it their own, how to do it well, how to do it right, and then you kind of make it your own over time. So I started like everybody does. I think the first year enrollment was 50 or 60 people because that's the 50 or 60 people that took it every year as part of some sort of core curriculum. Uh, however, because people liked the way that we had modified the class uh, uh, early on and were more experimental and tried experimental text and a lot of stuff with international news. And I very early on adopted international film. Uh, then I wrote my own textbook, which was much more kind of loose and freewheeling and approachable. Uh, more and more students said, hey, this class is kind of cool and I learned some stuff and I like it. So it bumped up to about a class a room size of 600, kind of the standard biggest lecture hall on campus every one of you wherever whatever campus you're on has the big room or maybe a couple of them that seats anywhere from 500 to 1000 students and so i did that I, I taught a class of 50 for maybe five years then i taught uh, a class of 500 to 600 for about another five or perhaps eight years and, and then things start to go off the rails because that's about the time that i met katie pritchard who's already you've already been introduced to uh, and she was the smart cookie that said, hey, the demand for this class is really going through the roof. At one point, you know, we could only seat 575 people in this room. And then so 575 people, uh, uh, seats available, 575 students had signed up for the class. And then there was an outstanding 3,975 request for this course. And it got so crazy. We're like, <laughs> This is outrageous. Let's get the actual performance hall on campus. And all of your campuses have a performance hall. And uh, in one fell swoop, let's just teach 3,000 people at one time, wipe out all the demand, and therefore, and it probably won't be that good. And so we'll, in a, in a two pronged approach, it, the class won't be that good. So people won't like it as much and we'll wipe out all the latent demand. And so then we can go back to teaching the small class. However, because of the innovations that were happening at the time, and this is roughly a decade ago, maybe a little more, uh, think about the, a decade or 12 years ago is when social media became a thing. Yeah, I know it existed before then, but it became a thing. Uh, uh, online classes really became more of a thing. Uh, just the networking, became more not just acceptable but faster cooler better so you could start to do more things and it was because of that and the fortuitous meeting of katie who said hey here's what all the cool kids are doing we got this cool new thing called twitter uh we have these chat rooms here's where students eyes are and i said okay well cool well that's where students eyes are and you think we can pull this off let's do it and we did lots of innovative stuff in the class with actual live twitter feeds the very first year twitter was out and there was other things like music programs we had used or students could participate digitally in the class. That's right when uh, polls and surveys, live polls and surveys became much more flexible and, uh, and had great utility. So we did a combination of crazy stuff like that in the super size phase where we went to about 3000 students every fall semester. Uh, and that was a real challenge because it's a lot of people in a small room and uh, just 3,000 people moving in and out of a room <laughs> is a pain. Uh, we would teach for four hours straight on a Monday because it was hard to book the room more than one day. So that was an experiment that we thought would go off the rails quickly, but it ended up working. So we did that for four years, five years, and that led us up into phase four of uh, teaching these courses, and that is digital upgrade. Because remember, social media and all these crazy new tools were coming out 10 years ago communications are getting faster better cooler and more and more people are starting to dabble with real online classes i'm not talking about the classes that people said i've been teaching online classes since 1975 no you put your syllabus online and then had people turn in a paper but that's not the same as actually engaging and teaching people live uh, uh online the technology finally caught up i never wanted to teach online but i thought 
this is where people's eyes are. This is where the future is. You can just tell. We actually, the last year that we taught in the big auditorium to 3,000 people, we offered, hey, would you like to see uh, Boyer teach live? Or would you like it to be recorded? Or would you like it to be live streamed? And we gave students the option. So I was lecturing in the room and everybody, by the way, everybody said, no, no, I want to see it live. Lecturing live is great. I want to be there. I want to feel it. I want to smell it. I want to taste it. It's going to be cool. If you give people the option between live and live streaming it and they can sit at home on their couch and watch it, literally within one month, 90% of the class was watching it at home or perhaps not watching it all, but we assume watching it at home and then we would record the, the live streams and then other people would not even watch it live. They would watch it when they felt like watching it. So even though everybody said they wanted this thing, everybody's behavior was pushing us in a different direction. And that's why about 2015, we went completely digital. Uh, again, even though all surveys indicated people wanted us to teach live, they would consume the material online. Given any option, they would consume the material online. So we said, that's fine. So we recorded all of our lectures, built a little studio like the one we're in right now. And of course, uh, this is now easy to do with great technology, great sound equipment, but get great cameras, great lighting equipment, which costs nothing. This is how much things have evolved in 20 years. This stuff didn't exist 20 years ago. And now it's pennies on the dollar to create your own studio. And it's a fantastic opportunity for instructors to do whatever medium they want with just a little bit of work, just a little bit of training. Even I know how to operate this stuff now, and I'm old and not that smart. So the digital upgrade, and now we sporadically test the waters to see where people are and offer uh, a stylistic showdown about every three years, I'll say, hey, you know what? I'm going to teach online like I've been doing uh, for this same class, and I'm gonna teach it live. If anybody wants to sign up to in a room of 500, who wants to go which way? Then again, this was before COVID hit where you couldn't do anything live. Uh, and now that COVID's hit and everybody's been forced to go online, I'm going to cut to the end of the presentation right this second. Now that everybody's been forced to go online and all students have been forced to watch stuff online, I kind of feel like the fun's over and people are over Zoom. Sorry, I know we're on Zoom right now. It's great. Uh, but people are over it. And so I'm actually looking forward to going back live again. And I think people are starting to chomp at the bit of like, no, we've now, the, the last generation of students was going online and now they're fully online. Then they were forced online. And I think a lot more people can be like, I want to go back live again because I miss it or I never experienced it to begin with. So we're already going to keep doing the stylistic showdown of let's do it online for those that want that format. Let's do it live and continue to test the waters to see how people will learn best and what results we get out of them, both for grades, but also attitude and engagement. So that's the whole background of how we started to engage people. And this is now, this talk is about, for the rest of the talk, how do you engage people? What is this thing about being positive in class and building positive point accumulation? Well, before I get to it, and I call it flipping the syllabus, positive point accumulation, is the whole system that we embraced about a decade ago when we were doing a lot of these things. When we were dabbling with lots of different technologies and different assignments, we had more ideas than we had time to enact uh, in a group of 3,000 people. So we started making things optional, saying, hey, you can do this. It's, you know, the old, uh, old school saying, you can do this for extra credit. You can do that for extra credit. And the more we thought about extra, we just kind of got over and said, why don't we just let them do whatever they want? for credit and build their credit up, like their credit score rating when they get out of college. Uh, but before I get to the particulars of how we do it, what it's about and how we do it, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of text now. And you, I'm gonna run through it because this is a, a presentation that you can download and peruse uh, for, at your own pace. And by the way, steal it all, I don't care, it's yours. Anything you like, take it. So. I think there's now a few inconvenient truths that we have to point out before we get to some of the experimental stuff we've been doing. Uh, uh, they got Al Gore there, the inconvenient truth, and also uh, AKA a series of unfortunate events that are unfolding on higher ed. Uh, and one is that 
information and facts are cheap. Uh, and students don't need you for that. There's this whole new thing out there called the interwebs. I don't know if you've heard of it. It has every fact ever known to all human history at your fingertips all the time. Every book, every film, every experiment, every diagram, it's all there. If you are trying to get students in a room so that you can give them facts, you're already wasting your time and you're wasting theirs. They already have all that. And if they don't have it, they can look it up in two seconds. So students don't need you for information. They don't need you for data. The second inconvenient truth is your exams and your wonderful assessments and assignments are very well crafted. They're exceptionally thoughtful and they're very challenging. And the truth is every student already has all the answers to everything you've ever created. And many of them will cheat. I hate using that word. It's a bad word. But unless you write a new quiz and a new test every single semester you teach a class, if you don't know this already, it's all on the web. And you can be like, no, no, no. I just wrote this test literally last year. Yep, it's on the web and it's shared on various sites already. Students now are so savvy, they can get on for anything. I could go right now, look up a, a section of physics at Harvard right now, and I will find a trove of every single test and exam they've ever had itemized by the professor. So we asked students how they cheated. We even asked students, I had students do a survey on cheating just for fun uh, three or four years ago and said, hey, how do you guys cheat? I, I, I'm not trying to bust anybody, I'm curious. And man, I got way more answers. I, I thought I was pretty good. I'm like, no, oh, wow, no, these guys are very good. They even know how to game watching a film. That was the one that got me. So people in my course, and I'm gonna get to uh, have the use of film briefly in a bit. I thought, well, I can build things in that are very hard to cheat at or impossible to cheat in. Like, I'm gonna make people watch a film. I'm gonna make you watch an international film from a different part of the world. Then I'm gonna give you a quiz on that film. And I, in the quiz questions, make them so difficult that it's like, no, 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 there, you know, there's no answer key. We go search online to wipe out any answer keys for our courses. Katie does all the time. Uh, so even if students don't have a, a, a leftover quiz from last year, uh, what students said is, oh, your films, uh, some, some students, by the way, oh, we don't watch the films. Uh, we just go in, you can download transcripts of every film ever made. And then I, I read your question about, uh, what did Mei Lin say to her daughter uh, after the earthquake in this scene of this film set in China? Uh, and I keyword search your question in the transcript of the film that I didn't watch and found the answer. And you're like, oh my gosh, you, you must be kidding me. You, wow, even watching a film is too much. So that gets back to, yes, even me, I, I as clever as I'd like to think I am, every assignment I come up with, someone will figure out how to game it. And if you're giving classic old school tests and exams and essays, and they already got all of it, 100% of it is already out there. Uh, the next point is social media totally sucks. I'm old, I think it sucks, but you should embrace it. On that same front, I think laptops and phones and all other devices in the classroom totally suck. You should probably embrace those too. If you want to truly engage and give people a positive, uh, 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 experience in the classroom and, and build a classroom setting that they want to participate in, then you have to think of creative ways to deal with and embrace all of these issues that many of us don't like. Now, again, some of you are probably way younger than me. Maybe you love it, but it is a challenge. It's social media and technology in the classroom are a huge challenge. Figure out ways to embrace it. Because when you take all this together, the old school saying is the age or the, the sage on the stage. That's what we are. We're up there giving out knowledge to the open and inquiring sponges of minds who just want to hang on every one of our words and get this knowledge they can't get anywhere else and get this information they can't get anywhere else. And the thing is that that age is over. I, I mean, I say it's slipping away. To me, it's kind of over. If you're not doing things that are wildly engaging and intriguing and new and embracing technologies and creating new content, what is it you're being paid for? Uh, because to transmit a series of facts to a group of humans in a room, 
we don't need teachers for that anymore. We already got the internet for that. So there are lots of things we can do to uh, capture that curiosity, to harness it, to engage with uh, folks. And I only teach a couple of classes. You all teach a variety of other classes, but there are ways to make everything what I call cool, everything. And the trick for the future of our profession is, how do you do that? How do you get people to like it so much they don't bother cheating? How do you get people to engage so much that you, the teacher, don't have to do 99% of the heavy lifting? How do you engage them so much they want to help you lift the load? That is the critical uh, challenge of our time in this particular profession. Now, how did we deal with ever increasing huge uh, classrooms? Uh, our large uh, slash on completely online classroom now, uh, basic philosophy, and this is the slides I'm going to go through fast and you can go look at them on your own uh, time. Uh, the instinct with a bigger and bigger and bigger class is to overstructure, have well-defined guidelines, rigid due dates. We've done the complete opposite. We said, hey, we want to have maximum flexibility in assignments, maximum flexibility in communications, a maximum and in increased interactions amongst all players, and that is the students amongst themselves uh, and the uh, professor with the students. And in essence, we want to take the structure that everybody kind of assumes is it must be rigid. It's top down. I am the smart person in the front of the room. You are the dumb people that are here to listen to me and you'll be smarter. That's a very hierarchical, rigid system, top down. And I just got to a point where I'm like, this is almost impossible because there's too many people, too many backgrounds, too much going on in their own heads, too much going on in their own lives. And I'm teaching about the world. I don't know everything. So how do we get away from that structure altogether and decentralize it so that the users, that is the students, end up taking more responsibility for themselves and doing more stuff amongst themselves in an effort to get them to learn the stuff that I kind of want to get them to learn. So the system we came up with is learner centered to allow people to engage and learn in ways best suited to them. Okay. This is going to, this sounds already perhaps way too touchy feely, but there are some guidelines. There are some guardrails on this experiment. They're just hidden very well. We'll get to that in a minute. So uh, learner centered students are treated as individuals and expected, expected, not encouraged to take ownership over what they're doing in the course and hopefully create some class synergy beyond the walls of the classroom because of course we don't have walls anymore not in the last covid year to do this we incorporate as much social networking technologies to build community and engagement and social presence out of the classroom not in it uh, this creates a positive food feedback loop to empower students when it comes to assessment and i say the way we're doing all this is the positive point accrual system. This is not anything that innovative though, folks. <laughs> some of you maybe already do this. Probably many of you took a course at some point in your career that did this. And this uh, positive point slash flipping the syllabus is uh, the shift of coursework from the instructor to the student, both of options and ownership. I keep stressing ownership, ownership, ownership. Eyes from day one tell the students, this is your course. It's not this isn't my course that you're sitting in. This is your course. What do you want to do with it? Do you just want to skate by and get a C? Here's a path. Do you really want to learn a lot? Here's a path. Do you want to do a little bit of both? You want to get, you don't want to work, put in the minimum amount of work, but learn some and so you can get an A if that's what you want. Then here's a path. It's up to you, the user slash the student. Uh, and again, I came up with this concept. Um, back at South by Southwest, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago when they started the EDU initiative. And that's when I first started flipping the syllabus. This is something I don't need to explain. Most of you probably heard it. Uh, you flip the syllabus, reverse teaching model that delivers instruction at home. So you put all, it, it, uh, flipping the syllabus is make all, uh, uh, prioritize the home work part of it. You do all this reading and stuff at home, stuff that you do as an individual, do all of that at home. And then when you come in and we have shared time together, let's actually share that time together to reinforce facts or have instructions or laboratory work or creative time or interaction, all that stuff. That's flipping the syllabus. It's 
I would assume all of you have heard this concept. It's kind of old hat by now. Uh, I kind of wanted to take it a step further. So instead of just saying, hey, you do all the work on your time and we'll get together and, and chat about it, uh, I first flipped the content. So like I told you, we used to be live, live to a small group, then live to a bigger group, then live to an astronomically bigger group. And instead of going in and doing the live lectures, which I adored, I was good at it too. I'm old now, friends, but I used to be really good at this talking stuff. And that's one of the reasons why this, the classroom had energy to it, because I was up on the stage providing some of that energy and people fed off that and really liked it. So I hesitantly said, well, if we're going to go online, then it's no, the live part of it, if you're going to give people options to watch the stuff anytime they want to watch it, then that's not live anymore. And you want to make sure that everybody has the same content. So we're going to have to pre-record this because if I said, oh, you can watch this live if you want, and therefore you could ask questions if it's live, but if you watch this and it's recorded, you don't get to have uh, questions. So I said, okay, let's flip the content first. So you'll see on our Plat Avenger site, uh, uh, up on that one tab with classroom, online education, there's a whole world regional geography lecture series right there. Uh, Katie will type in the link to that if you wanna go check it out on your own uh, time. By the way, it's wildly outdated. We, we're so far behind and keeping up with this stuff. But if you click on the lecture series, then you'll see me there in my very scholarly academic look with my pipe, although I don't smoke. Uh, and then all of the lectures for the whole semester, depending on what I'm teaching that semester are hot linked. And then if you click say just on the intro, you'll see that it goes to a series of vignettes. It's a singular narrative. I'm very still very focused uh, that the best teaching happens with a narrative. You have to have a beginning, a middle and an end. You want to tell people a story. I don't even care if you're teaching mathematics. You're still telling people a story. You got to get from point A to point B. You got to teach them how to add and subtract before you do a uh, long division. So it to me, uh, uh, most of your energy, no matter what you're teaching and what you want to redo uh, your courses as in the future, focus on the narrative. What is the story I'm trying to tell? What, what arc am I trying to get people to by the end of the class? I'm like, ah, I'm smarter than I used to be on day one. But having that narrative, uh, almost a linear narrative, uh, is very important for students. It's a path. Yes, question. John Donner, how do you handle a situation Well, uh, uh, the question was, and you said it was from John, uh, asked how do you ensure uh, that students do all of the pre-work, uh, watch all the videos before you have uh, live lecture time? Well, as you'll see, as I go through about another five or 10 slides, I actually don't. So the way that, um, the way that we work it is, everything is very independent. You can choose to come watch this video series on this presentation you see in front of you and you click on any of those and actually I think it, you can click on it and a video you click on very first part of it intro to world regions and a video window pops up and you can start watching that video and then of course then you go to section two going global section three plan for making sense of the planet and what i do is i say here's this lecture uh, and I'm going to give you a quiz after, say you watch part one and part two and part three of this intro lecture, then you go take a quiz on it and you get points for taking that quiz. That's how we work. So I don't do the, uh, the kind of classic flip syllabus where I'm like, go do all the homework and then we're going to get in the, get together and do something. I say, here's a whole bunch of homework you can do to earn points towards your grade and do what you like. Uh, and if we get together for something, that's an entirely separate thing altogether. So uh, when I get a groups of students together, I do it all voluntarily anymore because we have so many options. It's just another option. If you want to talk live with me, I welcome it. It's great. I would love it. But I ain't making anybody do it because there's plenty of options for each student to do lots of different assignments to earn their grade. Uh, I'm debating about next year when we go back to live that I still might on the same uh, 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 front, John, I probably am going, the future for me is 
I'm going to say watch these first three or four lecture videos and then and then for those that want we're going to get together on Friday and I'm going to do a live lecture that I hit upon some of those points and answer questions and pull in some other additional information on a current event or something that interests me and then I'm going to give all the people in that room a quiz an opportunity for a quiz that the people who are not in the room will not have that opportunity again you don't have to do everything in my course in fact you don't have there's no single thing that you have to do at all you just have to do work but i'm getting ahead of myself perhaps i should have explained the positive point thing a little bit more uh the lectures are also available on itunes uh, i only threw this in because it's important to put if you're going to record stuff if you're going to make content put it on as many platforms as you can because you're increasing the likelihood that people will watch it if it's on the platform they like so you can't just say, well, I'm going to put this here because I because it's easy for me, the instructor. It's like you can and you can force them to do it. But by simply forcing them to do something that you're bending them to your will and it doesn't seem as engaging and and fun. If I say, hey, here's five places because some people like I don't I'm not on iTunes. I don't like it at all. Other people like I only do iTunes. I love it that his, this professor's lectures are everywhere and I can access them the way I like to access them. Yes. That's right. So we found that some students really love my lectures on YouTube because you can accelerate the speed. <laughs> Maybe some of you have found this out already. Uh, if you have a half hour lecture, a student can go on YouTube and press two times the speed and listen to you talk like, uh, make it out. but they they process stuff faster than I do. I'm old. So uh, I think it's goofy, uh, but they get through the lecture in 15 minutes instead of 30 minutes. <laughs> the other thing I love about recorded lectures, by the way, side note, uh, is that it's also increasing flexibility gigantically. When you record your lecture for the week, say I'm going to lecture one hour this week, and you record it on day one of the week, the student can watch it. They can watch it anytime they want the whole week. That's incredibly empowering to the student. And not only that, they can watch it multiple times so if they didn't get it the first time they can watch it a second third or fourth or fifth time that was the thing that actually convinced me to go digital by the way was because so many people are furiously writing down notes in a live lecture in the classic old school way we do it and then they you know there some people's minds just work differently and they're so busy writing down stuff they actually didn't absorb it and, and then it, when it's live that's it did you get it? Because I ain't doing nothing else. I gave it to you. I, I talked for an hour. Good luck, suckers. Hopefully you understood everything I said. Uh, and especially when you teach them about the world or whatever field you're in, there's complicated terms. So there's things that are hard to spell. I'm talking about like Boutros, Boutros, golly of the United Nations. No one knows how the hell to spell that off the top of their head. So recording significantly, maybe exponentially uh, empowers students uh, with flexibility and the uh, uh, the flexibility to watch whenever and however many times they want. Isn't that what we're in the game for, is to get people to review and review and review, and if you don't understand it, go do it again. Uh, that's what this is really good for. Okay, but again, I've gotten ahead of myself, and I'm sure it's almost time to end this lecture already, although we have 700 slides to go. But the flipping the syllabus thing, uh, once I flipped the content, I said, I'm going to put all the content online, and it's there. And you can watch it whenever you want. And of course, we have book reading quizzes too. And so you buy the book. That's pretty much like it's on. And then all, all my books are online now too. But you buy the book. You, you can do that whenever you want. It's yours. Uh, you can read it and do the quizzes whenever you want. The lectures are now all online. So basically, everything's like here, students. All the tools, all the knowledge is in your lap. It's up to you to start going through it. That's flipping the content. Now we're going to flip the syllabus. And so this is when we say uh, multiple avenues of opportunity for students to demonstrate their knowledge and performance while accumulating points. There is no single test everybody must do. There is no midterm and final. There is no set amount of exercises that equal 100%. That's quite important. Uh, because you can be flexible and say, well, I already uh, do that. I have um, a, a midterm and a final and people can just do whatever they want and it adds up to their grade. And it's like, no, 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 that's not the concept. The concept is that you have opportunities to have way more points 
then you even need to get an A. Therefore, the student is allowed to pick what things they want to do. Some people will get an A one month before the semester even ends because they worked ahead and done so much stuff. Other people, they got sick for a week or two. I got COVID, I was out for a month, that's fine. They're like, can I make up work? You don't have to, you just miss that section of work. There's still plenty of other things to do. So at the end of the semester, the students' points are tallied, and by the way, it's not the end of the semester, their points are tallied every second they're working. There's a column on the end of the spreadsheet that says, here's how many points you have. Keep going until you get the points you want for the grade you want. And there's a final grade assessed based on a predetermined criterion reference scale. Okay. So here are the reasons we do this, especially when you get into big groups of humans, uh, 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 working professional students, online students. We have students now in multiple time zones. How the hell are you going to do anything live in that scenario? I mean, we tried, many of you have tried with Zoom, but you got people from around the world, you got working people, you got people coming back to school who have families and, and jobs. And to try to pigeonhole everybody in and say, you have to be on my schedule is just not realistic in this century. Question. I definitely think this is gamification, um, kind of. Uh, I would love to gamify it completely by having some sort of prizes and or rewards besides the grade. Obviously, knowledge is the reward, but <laughs> but to gamify it more, I, I've been thinking about this for years and I just haven't got around to it. I've just gotten too busy. And no, I'm an exceptionally lazy uh, professor type. I have not really sat down and written papers or done research projects on the stuff that we do. Other people have. And if you hit me up on email, I can point you to some other uh, assessments and research papers that people at Virginia Tech and then maybe a couple of places have done on this, but I myself have not done it. I usually just like to provide the pool <laughs> of students to get surveyed or to test and things of that nature. So uh, uh, in today's world, huge groups of people, and if you teach online, it's going to get huger and huger and huger. Uh, you got to have that flexibility. Uh, they focus on point accumulation rather than point deduction, positive versus negative reinforcement. And that's what the whole title of this talk is, positive point accumulation, positively engaging. And what that uh, uh, wordplay is all about is, I ask people this all the time when I've done talks like this in the past. It's a, it's a great trick question. Many of you will get it immediately. At what point in the semester in a classically uh, taught structured uh, course, at what point does the student have the highest grade? Does anybody know the answer? At what point, and I don't care what you teach, at what point does the student have a perfect record and the highest grade that they're ever gonna get for that entire semester? I'll give you 10 seconds to try to answer online. <laughs> no, it's okay. Katie says she's answering questions too. So I'll cut to the chase since we're uh, almost out of time already. Uh, the first day of class, the first day of class in a typical structured uh, course, they haven't failed anything yet. Uh, the way that we have done higher ed and mostly education in general forever is that we say, here are the 10 things you are going to do for me, the professor, this semester. You're going to take a weekly quiz or you're going to take a pop quiz or you're going to take a midterm or you're going to write a paper. All of these things are set in stone point wise. And I, the professor, will then grade you. And therefore, every week that goes by, you will lose points. You will lose. That's what the whole system is based upon. If you get, again, if you're a perfect student and you get 100s on everything, then yes, you don't lose. That's no one. Okay. That's virtually no one. So the way it's set up is there's 100% you can get. That's it. It's total, it's finite, it's measured. And every week in every assignment, I will grade you and you will get knocked down a point or two or three or four or 10. The positive point accumulate, and that's a negative reinforcement. That's why people stress about tests. They're like, oh my God, I'm gonna mess this question. I'm gonna, oh, if I, if I fail this exam, I'm gonna be so screwed. Oh my God, uh, my life's gonna be over. I have to do well on this, this one thing. 
And I just got over that a long time ago, again, especially in big classes, because you have too many excuses. You have too many people that have too many things going on in their lives. And the more people you're dealing with, the more, and these are sometimes valid excuses. Uh, sometimes they're not, but you, you know, you have empathy and sympathy or empathy or both uh, for students. And so you want them to do well, but it's like, man, I know your grandma just died or this just happened. You're in a car wreck or you just got COVID. Yes. Uh, and so it become, and there's so much stress to do well on every test and not miss a single point that people get over anxious about it. And that's what they focus on is losing that point instead of what are you supposed to be focusing on? Getting smarter, gaining knowledge. That's what you're supposed to be focusing on. I'm sorry, do you have another question, Katie? With, uh, eight minute left, so a minute. Well, but I know they said I should lecture to four minute 45 and then answer questions, but we've been answering questions along the way. So I, I can just, I'll keep trying. Okay, yeah, I just have one. Can you, get, can you put up your points? Like, yes, that's all good to write. Uh, okay, uh, finally, this encourages individual expression and creativity and empowers the user with choice. So when you give people more choices than they need, they choose the stuff they are better at expressing themselves in. Some people hate writing papers and would never choose that option in my class. Some people love writing papers. I value those papers way higher. So people can work really hard and write a paper if you want, and you, they usually do really well on them. But if you don't like writing and you suck at it and it's stressful to you, you don't got to do it. People are allowed to choose when they do content, what content they do, and what assignments they de demonstrate that knowledge uh, as well. So positive point accumulation. This is the question Katie was just saying. Do you have the syllabus? Of course I have the syllabus, our flip syllabus example. Uh, is uh, that, and this is even an old one, it changes every semester because we invent new things. But here's roughly what it is. Uh, every week you have a book reading quiz, 13 weeks in a semester, each of them was worth 30 points. You can take those quizzes as many times as you want. Uh, they're almost, I think they're all open on day one. On day one of the classes, like here, you can read the whole book and do all these weekly quizzes. But every week that goes by, one disappears. So this helps keep people on track. So. Here's all the stuff you can do on day one. What I do now is say, you can do all, you can work as hard as you want right out of the gate, but you can't wait to the last minute to try to do everything because we all know that doesn't work and people fail. So there are lots of assignments, most of which are all open on day one of the class, but as every week ticks by, quiz one for week one goes away. This is just a book reading quiz. And there's a video lecture quiz one that goes away after week one's over. And you, all of these things, there's assignments all over the place, but they are paced. You can work ahead, but you can't get behind. And what you see roughly here uh, on the screen is different uh, of, um, assignments are worth different points. I even This is a really old syllabus because I have a midterm and a final exam on here. I don't even do that anymore. I gave up on those. They're just too much of a hassle. And they weren't, what were they testing? Mostly midterm and final exams test how good of a test taker people are. I'm not sure they really test knowledge that much anymore. But if you're a really good test taker, hell, you can pass anything. If you're a, maybe a genius, but you suck at taking tests, then it's going to look like you're not very smart. So I got rid of those kind of big things. But there's films. Uh, there's non-class events, papers. You can go see uh, 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 other talks on other parts of the university and write a paper on them. We used to have Atlas quizzes. We had a Twitter assignment. I would let people do a world leader bio. Uh, we, the Twitter assignment is we would let people pretend to be a world leader for the semester and they had to tweet every single day. And then we'd give you points about according to how much work you did and how well you did at it. Uh, there was an international interview assignment. There were sporadic pop quizzes. I would just say, hey, I'm gonna lecture on the Iranian nuclear deal on Friday. Tune in live if you like. If not, that's fine. I'm gonna talk about it for an hour and then I'm gonna create a quiz on it. Do you have to do it? Nope, you can if you want. So at the end of the semester, and it's all arbitrary based on what you wanna do, I say, oh, you need 1300 points to get an A, 1200 points to get a B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? This allows, again, maximum flexibility in assignments. Peeps can do any, the things that are best at to prove their knowledge. And again, most of it happens on their schedule. However, you do have to provide guardrails and that's why you do have deadlines 
So it's not as if you just do whatever you want and wait till the last day of the semester and do everything. Nope. Uh, the last day of the semester, there's nothing open anymore in my class because it's sporadically, weekly, on a regular basis, gone away. Cool? Did that answer some of the questions? And by the way, the last little line that just popped up here is not a throwaway line. What I have found in today's modern world with the intrawebs and uh, cheating websites and just shared everything is that to give the same quiz every year for 10 years is folly. You're not testing anybody on anything. They just, they'll just go find the answers. But when you make people work, when they have to go do 10 assignments a week, or at least have the option to do 10 assignments a week, and they have to watch a film, and they have to do this, or they have to write a paper, or they have the option to do these things, I should say, what I'm doing is making them build a body of work. And that is exceptionally harder to fake. Now, can you still fake that? You can, but students are working just as hard to fake it as if they just did it. And most of them get it pretty quickly. So allowing for way more assignments, not just as flexible, but it's making people get in the mindset of actually doing stuff, not waiting to the final exam. Be like, well, it's all or nothing. Uh, even if I didn't do any work, I could go in here and answer stuff good enough and get credit. It's like, no, to me, that's not proof of enough anymore. I want to see that you put in time every week and read stuff and watch stuff and you took quizzes on stuff and you turned in papers on even if they're little papers uh, by the way the twitter assignment is like one big ass paper uh when we introduced that assignment we would force uh, not force the rules were if you want to tweet as uh, uh angela merkel chancellor of germany and you were going to take on that role you had to tweet every day you had to tweet at least three times every day as angela merkel telling us what angela merkel is doing Where's Angela Merkel at? Who is she meeting with? What policy is she working on? And so it, what seems like a very simplistic assignment, and a lot of people early on in Twitter's uh, early days were like, that's stupid. What, what a goofy thing. How do you even grade that? And it's like, dudes, at the end of the semester, we can go look at Angela Merkel's fake account that we have set up, and they've tweeted three or four sentences every day for three and a half months. That's like a 20 or 30 page term paper. And students walk away from that going, I know everything about European politics because I did this one funny social media thing and it sticks with them for life. That's engagement and giving people options to do stuff, which is kind of off the wall. Uh, I'll continue, even though I, I'm sure I'm out of time. You have, are you, okay. Oh, I thought she said minute 45. Sorry, everyone. So I'll answer questions now, although before I even get to that first question, I will tell you this, uh, the way you game this system to the students, or I should say game the students, is that remember, you're, in, you're still in charge. This isn't like I'm just inventing stuff and be like, whatever, however many points you want. The way you keep people on track is through deadlines and through reminders and weekly emails about what's due, but also you value you put higher point values on the things you really want the students to do, and they will naturally gravitate to do those things. That's how you game them. So for instance, I want people to read the book. There's a weekly reading chapter. Uh, every week, you have to read two chapters and take a quiz on it. I, I value that very highly. It's worth 30 points a week. It's 400 points by the end of the semester. That's a lot of points. And it's a fairly easy assignment. You just read it and go take some quizzes. Everybody does them because you'd be a fool not to. It, other assignments which don't require as much thought, perhaps, or as much knowledge, or as much work, you don't make them worth that many, uh, as many points. So what you're doing is providing flexibility, but you're also guiding people to kind of do the things that you want them to do, or at least partake in as much of those things as you really want them to do as frequently as possible. That's the way the video quizzes work with the lectures and the weekly book quizzes like they're valued highly enough that you would be a fool not to do them and people will naturally do them um, and by the way we got so much success with this that's why i just got rid of midterm exams and final exams i'm like this is i'd rather make people work for 13 weeks than test to see if they know stuff twice a semester uh and then the rest of the stuff is kind of new so now i'll answer questions uh about whatever else i can answer
and I will try to look at the chat room now too. Can I ask a question? Yes. In terms of coming up with this system, um, at some point you had to transition from doing things the old way to doing things the new way. And I just wondered if you had a, a, a response to the question, how much did it take you a summer to rejigger your syllabus for a particular class? So I know how much think time the redesign might take. I know I have to know myself in order to do that, but if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, actually, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. I Don't you love it when people say, that's a really good question. That's a really good question, Professor. Uh, I My instinct is that we did it so long ago, I think we had to kind of go all in. Um, I, I, I think the, the evolution of it was, and it was a quick evolution, as we said, why don't we do this? Uh, we started doing things when we had a really big group of people, really, the first time we had a really big group of people, we started to invent extra assignments, extra credit, because again, you have people whose, you know, grandmother died, or this happened, that happened, they got sick, and I need extra credit, I need extra credit, so we're like, okay, let's invent another assignment for extra credit, but we're going to offer it to everybody, because I've always said, well, it's not fair to give one person an opportunity, unless you're going to give it to everybody, so that's when we came up with the map atlas quizzes, I mean, that was just work just literally making people look up stuff in an atlas and learn how to use an atlas. And that was an extra assignment we did. And I can't remember what other extra assignment we did. I think the outside event papers, people like, hey, I really wanna go uh, hear this a professor from Saudi Arabia talk about you know this and uh, can I do a paper? I'm like, that's a great idea. That's an extra assignment. And we had queued up after a year or so uh, of big classes, we had queued up enough extra, extra assignments. I'm like, why don't we just offer this from the get go? And that's when we said, you know what, let's just go ahead and do the weekly, let's move the, the uh, book reading quizzes online, uh, which we did. So now we've got a critical mass very quickly. And I think it's when uh, it was like the third or fourth year that we did really huge classes that I told you about. We switched from supersized classes to digital. That's when we took the plunge. And we said, well, we're going online. So if we're gonna build all this video content, we're all in, let's, Let's go ahead and take the best of the best of the assignments that we've dabbled with for the last five or six years and just say, here it is. It's all on the syllabus. So you likely have already been doing this. I mean, you likely have already had assignments that you have dabbled with with your classes or that somebody came up with to do extra credit or whatever else they wanted to do uh, that you can just start building it out. And you I, said, I you we, said we, we did it about how many people were the we in terms of team. I'm just trying to conceive of man hours because I'm trying to describe this to a team at my college. And the question is, how many people or how many man hours should we dedicate this? Again, I know you can't answer that specific question. I I'm definitely just, can. It's 16.7 yeah. man hours uh, per week. <laughs> uh, uh, again, I was very lucky because we just accidentally organically evolved a lot of stuff we do. And I always had, uh, um, say, a TA. Or in the early days, I had a TA assigned to me for 20 hours. And then when the classes got bigger, I had two TAs assigned to me for 20 hours. And, and then I uh, met Katie. Uh, who started as an undergrad and had taken the class and then was a grad student and did some other things and then came back and she's like well I always liked your class and we should try this so it is hard for me to give you numbers because we had a very organic take on it however uh and again this is 15 years ago when a lot of the stuff is still kind of new even 10 years ago I would assume that your university has a lot of support in place almost all of them do uh, for whole teams of people who now help you with video production and content. If you don't, it's time to look for another job. No, no I'm joking. Like I, lots of folks now, even smaller universities have like a video office or a, a, there's a lot of help available in lots of different places. If you're completely on your own, yeah, you're gonna have to buckle down for a summer, figure out how to build a small studio, get a grant or spend a thousand bucks. And I, actually, you don't even have to do that. You can record off the computer anymore. But the higher the quality, the more thought out it is, the better it is for students. So no, I don't have a number, but Katie, you got anything else to add to that? Oh, I was just 
Yeah, get over here. But they're asking She's us, the smart they're asking one. us to wrap up too because we're out of time. Yeah. Um, I would just say I think there is a lot of time involved, but I feel like you should start one piece at a time. Take like for him, he did his like syllabus day of like let's go over the syllabus. That's like start with one video, start small, pick a piece of that you can just it's repeat every year. Like start there and then like move to week one, make one lecture or just take a part of it. And I think if you don't take it as a whole piece, like a whole class has to go online immediately. It's like, let's just pick things I know I talk about every semester yep. that I can start with a piece and then add a quiz on it, add a little bit more assignments for it and then meet in class and then slowly build instead of being like, this has to be done all at once where you're gonna start to see pieces that you can just put in cement and have ready to go in video. Yeah, true that. In fact, I still don't even have half the global topics that I want to on film, and I've been doing this for 10 years. So it, it's all it's just kind of a continuous piecemeal process. But we enjoy it. I mean, if, if you end up liking it and students like it, it's very rewarding. And if you're repeating the same thing every semester, it might be fun for you, but we all get old eventually. Can it? Put it on tape and people can watch you lecture 100 years from now. <laughs> and you can use that. It does take a lot of time, my friend, to figure out how to do the stuff and actually produce the content. But once you do, it's like, oh, I have a lot of time now. Uh, I have a lot more time on my hands to actually interact with students if I want to, or go write a book if I want to, or go lecture about some other stuff that I haven't had time to do. So it's quite liberating. And I always like to plant the seed, record everything you do because your great grandkids will get to watch you and say, hey, there's great grandpa uh, back in the aught. Ought nine, he was lecturing. Wow, look how young he looks. You will become eternal if you produce enough great content. John, this is a perfect segue for me. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alex Maxwell with Coursera, here to let everyone know that we're out of time officially and we have to wrap. I would like to thank everyone for joining. Sorry to cut the conversation short, but as John was saying, all of this is recorded. So we'll send, <laughs> we'll send that shortly once it's processed and ready to go and packaged up. Um, with that, I'm going to put the link in the chat to the next three sessions that are happening across the tracks. Feel free to use that link to join us. Um, and without further ado, I would like to uh, close the session, if that's Before okay. Before you close, can I say one last thing? Yes, you can. I knew you uh, would. <laughs> we, will try, we will go through all the chat room questions. And if you have other questions, Katie will put in our emails into the chat. Uh, and we will make another video to answer all of your questions one by one, and then we'll upload that to the my Course Hero page. Is that cool? More than cool with me. I'm sure the attendees are also excited about that. Thank you so much, John. Um, Absolutely. Katie, have you, you put all. the have you put the emails in the chat? Can I close out the chat? I think okay. so. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Here's the link again to go to the next thing. Thank you. Have a great weekend. <laughs> So this is a... And John, by the way, John, can you make me host if you don't mind? Yeah, thank you. All right, Katie, you have to do that. I don't know. <laughs> you said you have to make Welcome to the back end. <laughs> look at me, I don't know technology. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> All righty, let me, let me have a tasty host. Sorry, trying. Oh, no worries. There you go. Thank you so much. All right, now I can actually say goodbye to everyone. Have a good day. See you soon.